The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. This is Africa Diaspora Connect. Join us as we take the journey from the motherland to America. We share our experiences and learn from them. Here is our host, Kevadi Gaturu. Welcome, welcome. We're back. We're back. We're at it again. We're at it again. Hey, listen, it's been a ride. It was uh, week 10. Who knew? Week 10 already. And hey, listen, all you podcast users, we're loving you. We're loving the fact that you are now in audio mode. That's what we need to be. Yeah, Spotify, we're seeing you out there. Podbean, listen. Listen to this thing. There's it's nothing as beautiful as just having this pastime and being educated you know, entertained as well, and all that good stuff. So we're loving it. We're loving the transition. We'll always be there for you on YouTube. Uh, So it's going to be great. Now, this show tonight is the one. So what are we going today? Mental health awareness. It, It increases the chances for early intervention, which can result in a fast recovery. Awareness reduces negative adjectives that have been set to describe uh, our people with a, you know, with a mental illness. By raising awareness, mental health can now be seen as an illness. These illnesses can be managed by treatment. While one in five people will experience a mental illness uh, during their lifetime, everyone faces challenges in life that can impact their mental health. According to my research, anxiety disorders, next to depression, are are among the most common mental health disorders in young people. This can include phobias, panic disorders, social anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorders, or obsessive compulsive disorders, OCD. An estimated 10% of young people suffer from any one of the above. Today, we take you on a, a very touching and somber journey, a journey that's been kept under wraps, in extremely hushed tones, a parent's worst nightmare, a family's most feared gut-wrenching episode, coping with our children's mental illness, the denial of its existence, the guilt, the blame, the turmoil that ensues. I have here with me Carol and Kevin in the studio right here. And on Zoom, we have Shiro all the way from the Kansas City. Where are you at, darling? St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, St. Louis. My geography is off. I have an amazing cast of folks here today, and it's, this is this is this is something from a parent's perspective. This 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 is the one. This is the one. I'll go first and have you guys introduce yourselves. Kevin, you can go first, introduce yourself, and then we'll go from there. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a blessing to be here today. Uh, my name is Kevin Carranza, originally from Kenya. Came to the United States at the age of eleven. Uh, I've gone to school, um, high school, well, actually elementary school, high school, uh, college in the United States. Uh, I live in, with my parents in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I'm blessed to be here today. What do you do for a living? Oh, I am, uh, I'm in education. I am a chemistry teacher by trade and also an entrepreneur. All so right. I also work in a mental health field, uh, wow. working with children with aut- autism spectrum disorder. Wow. Yes. Wow. You're a chemistry teacher. I'm a chemistry teacher. You know, I couldn't spell chemistry when I was in high school. I couldn't even spell it. Uh, that's fine. There's a lot of people who have a phobia <laughs> for chemistry, but I try to that's make it me. as easy as possible. That's me. That's me. Carol, my dear, you're next. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm Carol. I'm 22. Right. I am a certified network engineer, and I am the youngest of my siblings. All six right. Of them. You're, six, yeah. you're, the, you're the youngest of six. Yeah. All right. And you came in this, how old were you when you came to the States? I was 13. You're 13. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And I went to middle school here and high school here and college. And you just graduated this year? Yeah, I just graduated beginning of this year. And with this whole pandemic, I'm sure it was you know, no graduation party, none of that, huh? None of that. It was really sad. But, but, but congratulations. <laughs> Thank Achievements. You. Shiro, coming all the way in Zoom Live. You're, the, <laughs> you're, my first Zoom, you're my first Zoom guest. Go ahead. I would love to hear oh. from you. Um, thank you for having me, and yes. I feel honored to be in this space today to be able to talk about mental health. My name is Shiro Karanja, and I am a huge mental health advocate. I'm 28 years old. Um, currently, I'm actually in grad school, and I'll be moving to London in two months ah. to King's College London. So school is like online right now until I move. Um, just because I wanted to be here for Thanksgiving before I moved. Um, born in Kenya, bred in the United States since I was like 
six years old. Uh Um, But we moved in between that, but we came to settle completely when I was 12 years old. Um, And I'm the firstborn of two. Right. (laughs) right. I'm the firstborn of two. So we have that in common. All yeah, right. so that, that's cool. So King's College in England. Why? Why the U? Why didn't you study in the U.S.? Why? Why are you going to England? So mental health is really huge in the U.K. Um, ever since like the royal family came out and did this thing called Heads Together, mental health became such a huge implementation uh-huh. um, in, in integrated in workspaces, social spaces, uh-huh. and it's still lacking in the United States. So I'm going to actually study global mental health. Uh-huh. Um, so and I guess I'll talk glo- more about glo- my organization. Global, global mental health, what you call it? Yep, global mental health. Wow. Um, Yale, Harvard, and Columbia are in the middle of getting the program uh-huh. started. Okay. Um, as far as like next next year, so like there's no master's program in the United States for that uh, right now. Kudos. Are you going to get an English accent when you go to England? I'm only kidding. Don't answer it. I'm only, I'm, only, I'm, only kidding. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. So let's get, so I want you to go first. All right, Shiro. All right. So yeah. you actually corrected me, uh, mental illness, mental health. Uh, you correct, you corrected me something. Just co- let's cover that. Let's, let's start with that. What you, you, you said something to me when I sent you that, 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 that text. Uh, can you cover that for us? Uh, please. Um, yeah. So when we talk about mental health, uh-huh. mental health is something we all have. We all have mental because health. It's, we all have mental health uh-huh. when it's your well-being, it's okay. your mental well-being. And uh-huh. by that, I mean, like you can have a really bad day uh-huh. and it affects you mentally. Okay. You become moody or you become sad or stressed like that is part of your mental health because it's your mind's well-being. Uh-huh. Now, when we talk about mental illness, we talk about diagnosed mental illnesses such as depression, anxiety, bipolar, OCD, all those things that you've talked about. And okay. it's also important to understand that even if you have mental illness, uh-huh. you can still be a high functioning member of society. For example, I have depression, but not like diagnosed, but it's like major depression. Okay. And I also have anxiety. Um, and But I'm still a high functioning member of society. Like I'm able to do anything any person who's not experiencing what I go through can go through. But it's a matter of learning yourself and understanding these terms. And the reason why I'm so adamant about us distinguishing what mental health and mental illness is is uh-huh. for also our community yes. to understand that there's nothing wrong with mental health. Cause I think when we say the word mental immediately sparks so much negativity. It does. Um, yeah. It does. Sorry. Do you have a question? No, no, it does. No, no. I, I love your flow. I love, I love your flow. Uh, uh, Kevin, uh, you're here today. I mean, uh, you, 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 you've been watching the show. What really prompted you to show up today? What is it about this topic that is so dear and close to you? What is it about it? So, um, just by watching the topics that have been part of the show, yeah. it brought me back to my younger self and my transition from uh, Kenya to uh, here. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, I'm going to be frank with honest with everybody that my first start in the United States was the most boringest thing ever, uh-huh. and I wanted to go back. My sure. I was 11 years old. You wanted to go back? I wanted to go back. Everybody wants to come here. You want to go back? I wanted to go back. My wow. friends were back there. My family was back there. Wow. Everybody I knew, my surroundings, my comfort zone was back in Kenya. I wanted to go back, and um, I came here with my, my grandparents, my show show. Uh-huh. They brought me here because my parents, my dad was already here. Okay. And then, you know, in the transition, they came here for the summer, and then they were leaving. So I started packing up my suitcase as they were leaving because yeah. I'm like, oh, you know, vacation is over. I'm going to go back to Furaha. Exactly. That's my, my elementary school back in, Af- in Africa. In, in Ken- Kenya. Yeah, Africa. It was, intoxication is very bad. Yeah. Um, so in, in Kenya, yeah. and then they said, no, you're not going anywhere. You're staying here. And I was like, no, nah, I can't. So... They, they put me here. I felt like abundant. Um, so for a while, it was just a big hurdle to get over for mm-hmm. the fact that you, you know, everything that you know was left behind. And it was not left behind because you wanted to leave it. It's because you're told we are leaving now. So what you're saying is this, and I've never thought about it that way. We, so basically, we as parents, uh, we're here thinking of that land of milk and honey. And at the back of our minds, we believe we have our children's best interest at heart, but we don't understand that we actually are uprooting you from a culture that you've been accustomed to, Mm -hmm. and we're bringing you to somewhere totally foreign, and we assume that you will assimilate, and this something is you're going to look forward to for the rest of your life, and and that's something that I've never thought about, exactly what you're saying. My dear, so you're here today. Um, Mm -hmm. Tell us your story, how you got here, and and, and that impact for you as well, and and, and why this this particular issue we're talking about is so prevalent in your life. 
I mean, I think it's the same thing for me moving here at 13 without an option, um, kind of having to figure out what it's like to be an American when you're so far from home and trying to kind of assimilate and get used to a new life uh -huh. when you've left everything that you know behind. So in that time, I kind of became really interested in mental health because in the time that I've been here, I've had a lot of connections with people who suffer from it. And also just realizing that a big part of it is the disconnect that we have with our parents mm -hmm. and how we communicate with our parents and how they contribute to having mental health issues. And so that's how I got inter interested in this subject and this field, because it's just so, it's kind of a dominoes game. It is. It, it all is. builds up. It's kind of cause and effect. And that's how I got into it and why it became so important to me, because I've seen a lot of people go through it and uh -huh. I've lost a lot of people to it. So it became really important to me. Wow, this is this is this is this is good stuff. So, so Shiro, what what triggers this? I mean, I heard you know you 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 feel abandoned. I heard that uh, you feel like you know you're forced to come to a totally new culture. You have not you have no say about it. But but Shiro, how how would you say what triggers? What really triggers this? How does it progress? Where did it stop from? If you could answer that, I would say our childhood. I think um, Kevin and. I'm so sorry. Ka Carol, 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 Carol. Yeah, Carol, they, they echo out so many strong points of how childhood is such a huge, important part of our mental health. Uh -huh. Because I actually have never looked at that, too. The fact that we're brought to this country and we really don't have a say because, yes, we're under our parents. But the thing with the child psychology is like your brain registers so much when you're a child uh -huh. because it's capable of doing that. And when you become an adult and you're brought you brought so many things of life because, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin and Carol, like for me growing up, what I was told was, you know, I'd go to school, get a good job, get married, have kids. And the cycle would go on, mm -hmm. but no one ever tells you that life is actually difficult. Life is hard. You have to deal with failing. You have to deal with relationships, be it partners, be it friends, be it family members, you have to deal with so much emotions as an adult. Mm -hmm. And if, if that's not caught on early as a child, mm -hmm. then whatever, anything can trigger it. Like a bad day at work can trigger it. Okay. Just a fight with a boyfriend can trigger it. So it's, it's not something specific. It's a lot of trauma that comes up in your adulthood that can cause an offset. Um, wow. Wow. Um, that, that for you. And just to even add on another point, like oh. our culture itself, especially young people, you know, they, they use alcohol as an escape and it's a form of sub substance abuse. If you look at it, because alcohol does not fix your problems, but it elevates your feelings in this good feel mood. So in essence too, like there's, there's a perpetration in our culture that if we drink, it's okay. But also, we need to check that because that doesn't even help the situation because then you lock in your emotions. And when your brain finally has had enough, mm. that is also a trigger. Wow. So, wow. yeah, there's a lot of components to it. And the thing is also in our culture, I mean, our parents, I'm a parent, you know, like, you know, I, I, I love my whiskey. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and my, my, my kids see me do it. And so it's, it's culturally accepted. So I guess, like you said, you mask it. And it's culture in our culture, you know, we, we do it. I think other than Zambia, I think in Africa where the Kenya is like the second hottest alcohol hitting country out there yeah. next next to Russia. Uh, but you know, we, we do it and it's accepted and but when we're masking something and like you said, you know, our emotions, what we don't understand is they can swim. You can drown we can drown them. They can swim. They'll always come to surface, you know. Um, let me ask you this. Is is it Anyone, I'll, you know, I'll, you, you know, Carol, is it genetic in any way? Do you, if, if you have, is it something, is it a, do you guys know that? Is there anyone in your family other than yourselves who've ever gone through this? Is it something genetic or is it an, indiv an individual thing that comes over time? Do you, do, would you know that? Is that? It could be genetic depending on what mental illness it is. Uh -huh. um, I know that with um, mental illnesses such as um, schizophrenia and bipolar, if you have it in your family history, it can then develop in you, but yeah, it but, needs but a trigger you, to set it on. Okay, the triggers. The triggers yeah. really do do that and over there. Um, early signs. How old were you when you thought something different happened? How? I mean, you talked about the abandonment when you felt you're not going back to the motherland. You felt you were abandoned. Uh, but uh, what are the early signs? When did you realize there's something different about yourself, Kevin? Uh, so, I, I, 
I, when I was in Kenya, I was very sociable, uh -huh. right? I was going out. I used to, you know, we lived in a village, so, you know, I would leave in the sunrise, come back at sunset. Yeah. Um, free. Out with friends. I was free. free. I was free as a bird. Free. And then when you come to the United States, is um, you're, you're taught to be cocooned in a house, right? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. people outside are horrible. Um, you get taken away. Uh, this neighborhood is, you know, X, Y, and Z. So you're, you're taught all this fear. So then every time you walk around, you're always on high guard, on high alert. Like somebody's yeah. going to snatch me. Somebody's going to take me. So eventually what happened is like, you know what? Anxiety uh, sets in. Anxiety, anxiety sets in. Yeah. You start isolating yourself from people. You do not go out as often. Um, you stop even engaging with your friends. Um, your life comes to, wow. you just go to school, you come home. You just go to school, you come home. And eventually at some point is even if, you know, my parents used to go to like, you know, birthday parties, they socialize with their friends and you would go and you would not really enjoy it because you're just like, man, like I'm going to see these people this Saturday, but I'm not going to see them for like another six months. So like, why even bother trying to talk to people that you're not going to see for a very long time? Let's talk about those parties, right? This party is honestly, with all due respect, I think it's for us parents. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like you're left out? It's just when you were younger, at these parties you go out to, there's a birthday party, it's your birthday party, but it's... At the end of the day, I think we we don't really. I think it's all about us. Is that would you? What would you? What's your comment on that? I mean, yeah, for the most part, because as kids, we don't really socialize enough with the other kids to form bonds or relationships. So uh -huh. it's really just for the parents to come out, have a good time, catch up with their friends, mm -hmm. and then go home. But as a kid, it's just you're not really having any meaningful relationships with those other kids. So, so, so let me ask something, Shiro. Do you think it's different for, for example, my kids who were born here? Uh, mm. who have been raised here, uh, and that's all they know, confinement, as opposed to you coming in from that freedom that he spoke, speaks very eloquent about. Is it different for our children who are born here and how, you know, and how they adapt and, and, and everything else? What do you think? Uh, born here versus born in the motherland. Is there any difference in that when it comes to mental health and mental illness? Um, first of all, I want to, if it's okay for me to go back on the question of, on mental health and and genetic. Okay. Um, so she talked about mental illness, but I'll mention mental health uh -huh. and I'll quote trauma. So things that happen to us as, as children, and then they come to us as an adult. Yeah. And if you don't deal with them, you will always pass those things on to your children in a subconscious conscious level that you do not understand, uh -huh. which is why I'm very huge on mental health and also individual growth, because you have a lot of things to unlearn uh -huh. as an adult. And like the one example I can say is cause, cause, um, communicating effectively is huge. And you've talked about how you're a parent yep. and I don't know how old your kids are. 21, they are. 19 and okay. uh, 19 months. Yeah. So at that age, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume, <laughs> I'm going to assume that you guys have so, some sort of a relationship, Yes, extreme. but there's something that we were never taught. And that is to communicate with our kids and also vice versa. Uh -huh. And that is so crucial to the child because that's why we grow up fearing our parents. Like we can't have dinners around them. You know, when you're a child in Kenya, you can't do that. Or you can't even just go tell your parents what you're going through. But I think starting out at an early age to implement these things that we like, maybe the African culture never really did instill uh -huh. is good because then mental health, we can decrease the chances of mental health and mental illness. Um, now, to answer your current question, um, please repeat it for me again. I'm sorry. So we were talking about, just to remind me, I think I lost my trend of thought there. <laughs> Is there a difference between kids? Yeah, kids who, who were here? born here. So, for example, my children were born here. Uh, yeah. is there the, are the struggles any different for them? Is it, is it a, a smoother patch for being born in this confined uh, society where they were, they grew up knowing that, you, you know, you can't be talking to strangers, all that kind of stuff. Is it any different for them being born here as opposed to coming in from uh, the motherland? I'll say it depends yeah. because if, if you if, if the parent was born in Kenya yeah. and what I've seen, the trend is more times than none. It doesn't matter where you really are on the planet. If you're in the UK, you're here, you're in Australia, uh -huh. you go outside and you're expected to be an American kid. But when you come back home, yeah. there's this expectation of the Kenyan household rules. Understood. So it, it honestly also depends on the parents and how they parent their children and the environment. Because yeah. I know some friends who were born here, but they equally struggle with identity crisis because they were born in this country, but it's still, you know, there's an expectation, you know, you're a Kenyan kid after yeah. a certain way. So it really depends. I, I can't say to the fact that there's an actual, um, actual answer for that. It's very, it's such a gray area, but 
the struggles would be different because when you come here, when you're 13, you also have to sort of like assimilate to a culture that you don't understand Uh as opposed to coming here when you were, I'm sorry, as opposed to being born here because you were born in the culture. So you probably have friends from the culture and you grew up with them, but still the rules may vary at home. So let's go to this. Uh, This is the elephant in the room, us, your parents. So we grew up in a culture where, Growing up myself, uh, we were seen and were not heard. And I think that's something that we have propagated to date with our own children. You know, you're seen, but you're not heard. Um, Kevin, uh, can you expound on that? And if it's something that's, that's, that you could just talk about in some of nature. So um, in terms like a, like a seen but not heard, right? Uh-huh. So I'm trying to think of examples because I've been out of my parents' house for so long okay, and you're, independent. You're, you're 30. So, yeah. so I'm, I'm thinking about examples of where situations where, you know, you, you, you would come in and as long as you do what your parents are expecting you to do, mm-hmm. they're not going to bother you. Yeah. Right. So they will. And it's all about perception. Right. Yeah. So you could be the worst child out there. Mm-hmm. But as long as you come in a home, mm-hmm. you're abiding by the culture. They will just let you be, uh-huh. right? You could go to your room, you come out when, you know, whenever you have dinner or, you know, whenever people come in, you greet them, you're very respectful. So that's the image that they carry with them, uh-huh. regardless of wherever they go, right? The problem comes in when you get a little bit older mm-hmm. and then people in the community starts knowing who you are and who your parents are. Okay. So now they start having another image of you mm-hmm. outside the household, right? Understood. Because, you know, you might go to the bank, um, you, you're very rude to the teller. Mm-hmm. You come home and you're like, oh, I saw Mama Nganya in the, in the bank and they said you were there as well. You did not greet her. You did not say hi to her, blah, 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 blah. And then they're like, then you're like, now you get like, oh, wow, these people, like now you see there's eyes everywhere, mm-hmm. right? And in terms of like when you're and, younger. And you have, to behave, you have to behave in a certain way. Right. All eyes on you all of a sudden. You're a center of attraction. I mean, you're the center of everything right now all of a sudden. Right. So, and, you know, just going back in terms of... Um, like when you're younger, um, like back to the parties, like that, that's a prime example of you're seen, but you're not heard, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So when you go to these parties with your parents, unless somebody is crying or there's a rocket somewhere, most of the parents don't care where the kids are. For real. They'll just put them on the side. Oh, they're playing. Uh, you'd be like, have you seen your child? Be like, oh, yeah, they're over there playing. And you don't even think twice about it. You just keep it moving, right? Especially us men, especially. You know what we used to hate? The birth when you're cutting the cake, mm. it's time to cut the cake. We're like, oh my goodness, we're gonna cut. The, like, can you go ahead and cut the cake without us? And it's so true. And I'm guilty of that. Right. I'm guilty of that. So how about you? I mean, this whole uh, we're talking about our parents, us, me in particular, um, and how we kind of like we're like a catalyst mm. in getting you to this abyss, um, coming in from our deep African roots. Um, what do we need to understand from your perspective? Uh, you know, in this new age, the 21st century, all right? Uh, telling you how we used to walk, you know, two miles to school. You don't care about that. You know, it's, 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 you really don't. But we give you all these folklore tales about us and the hardships and how privileged and how lucky you should be to be in America, mm-hmm. you know, you know, and talking about how the kids are hungry in, in, in Somalia. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, you know, tell us what's, what's, how does that, from, from a parent perspective, how do we escalate this and what can we do different, you know, to be seen and to be heard? I think one thing African parents need to remember is that the American culture is you speak up for yourself. When you go to school, you're taught to speak up for yourself. Uh-huh. You're taught to be vocal and to communicate your emotions, what you're feeling. Yeah. But when you go back to an African home, you're not allowed to do that. They don't know what it means to come and tell them that what you did upset me or what you did made me feel a certain way. It's unacceptable. You're talking back. But American culture tells you that if something is wrong, you should communicate yourself and you should be an advocate for yourself. So if African parents can create an environment that allows for their kids to communicate what's going on with them, then we can create an environment that allows for them to even say if they're having an issue with mental health. Uh If they're having Mm. some feelings that are not okay and that they need help. All right. So basically... As a community, as a culture, we need to be more open with our kids, especially if we're raising them in the diaspora. We need to open up communication and allow them to be open with us so that they can basically express themselves in the best ways possible so we can help them if there's a need for help. Mm-hmm. Communication. Shiro, what do you, what do you, what, uh, what do you then? I completely agree with the both of them. Yeah. Um, to Kevin's point, um, 
I think to be seen and not heard, like you both said, it's so quintessential that parents realize spending time with their children at a younger age is so vital. Um, and to echo on Carol's point, how do they start communicating with their child? It's at a very young age. It doesn't start when we're adults, you know, um, to, to give a good example, like my father and my, my sister and I were, were close. We talk about our emotions two way, actually, like my dad can tell us if he had a bad day and we can tell him vice versa. But a lot of unlearning had to happen on my dad's side. And then a lot of like learning and understanding uh-huh. had to happen on both my sister uh-huh. and I. But the, the thing that I will say is parents, you're human beings and uh-huh. you go through the human experience and your ca- kids are the same thing. So as a parent, it's okay to be vulnerable to your children because yeah. they're going to be parents too one day. Uh-huh. And you have to completely show the human experience to your children. Okay. And that's not saying that you need to say that when we show our emotions or we cry, it's a weakness uh-huh. or when we're stressed, we need to go pray. Uh-huh. Granted, that's fine, but we also need to take actions towards steps Mm -hmm. that are actually realistic because I think what's happening now with young people in Africa or globally, even back home, is that people are realizing, oh my God, I'm a human being and I have to be able to express myself. And if I cannot do that with my parent, Mm -hmm. then it becomes a discord. Mm -hmm. And that's the worst thing. Like you never want your child not to be able to come talk to you. And I think there's a lot of things that happen over the surface. So I think being able to communicate effectively, as I said earlier, uh-huh. and also parents and learning, and also one last point to parents, talk on Kevin's parents point. and learning, yeah. unlearning. Yeah, what does you that have mean? to unlearn? What does so that mean? unlearning. Yeah, you know, there's a quote that said that the amount of learning that you do in adulthood is unlearning. Uh-huh. So unlearning is actually unlearning the behaviors that you had in your head that were proper. Okay. So like how parents may think like, oh my God, okay, as long as I discipline my child and I go the African way, they'll turn up proper. No, you have to unlearn that. Uh-huh. You have to like unlearn that Understood. and now learn a new way how to parent your child. And I was going to use Kevin's example whereby he said, you know, if I go to the bank and let's say Kevin saw me and then I end up with Carol, I, I really don't understand that community effect. I've never understood it. I'm a pastor's kid. So Kevin, trust me, I know <laughs> <laughs> what you mean by that. And I, it got to a point where I had to have a conversation with my parents. Like I, I, I socially drink and I'll give this example because it's, it's the funniest one of them all. It's if you, if you give your parent and, and if you give your child that openness, it's become so easy mm-hmm. because I also don't understand why communities go around each other. So Chris, if you are my dad, and you know that I drink, I'd come and tell you, yeah, yo, like dad, like I drink socially. So in case you hear this from the community, you know, okay. and I loved it. One time someone tried to come and tell my folks I was doing something and my parents were like, oh, we know, you know? Okay. So it's like, cause also I think community, the Kenyan African community in general, there needs to be boundaries and there needs, to, there needs to be an understanding that if this is my child, uh-huh. it's my child yeah. and it's not someone else's so it's boundaries communicating effectively and unlearning you talked about discipline all right something discipline um what how can you teach us parents that discipline term? i mean because i got i got the hell kicked out of me back in the motherland i mean my dad (laughs) my dad was a judo expert uh, (laughs) and, and, and a taekwondo expert as well my mom was quick with the belts all right unlearning discipline what, what, how 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 does that affect or how what what have you heard from your friends how how that stigma what what, what do you know about it so um <laughs> discipline um i mean in kenya discipline was you know you go to school you do a bad thing yeah you get a cane you do all right i tell you this so yeah. i grew up in a place called Amuru, right yeah so we have a lot of um pear trees uh-huh. right where we grew up in school there used to be pear trees on a compound yeah so what teacher used to do if you don't do your homework you don't do what you're supposed to do they'd be like endo kachune mti pale ukuje ni kuchape nayo yeah so what that go, means go, go is cut that twig go get that twig <laughs> and bring it so choose your own Choose your own discipline tool. Yes. Right? Psychologically tormenting because then you're over there taking mm. like 30 minutes trying to figure out that thin one will hurt, a thick one will leave a, you know, bruises. The switch. Right. So, so, um, so then that carries over here where, you know, until 
you know, a cop shows up at your house, then parents are like, oh, snap. So I cannot do this. It's considered to be abuse in this culture. But uh -huh. back home, it was just a regular do, do, thing. Do you, think, do you think it's abusive? Do you think it is abuse? Or is it, do you think it's abuse? Corporal punishment. Corporal punishment, to some extent, is abuse. Uh -huh. Okay? It's a psychological... It's a psychological torture on a child, right? Yeah. So you but, are, but I think I turned out okay. I got my ass kicked, but I, I think I turned out okay. Well, that's a different culture that you came up with, okay. right? So the thing is, we have to remember something. Your children leave your house and go to school, yeah. right? Children compare notes, right? Uh -huh. What do you do in your house? Oh, we do this in your house. Uh -huh. Oh, what do you do in your house? We do this in your house, uh -huh. right? So wh when does a Kenyan child learn that if I get whipped in my house, I could call 911? Outside your house, ah, right? Yeah. So what, what happens is, for most parents, like, a, like the example I gave earlier where, you know, I was free as a bird, but when I came in, my parents instructed, told me to be fearful of my environment, right? So that's a sense of control mm -hmm. because they don't want me to engage with anybody because then if I'm engaging with anybody, then I get information from the outside that I could bring back into the house, mm -hmm. right? The same thing happens. But the thing is, what most parents need to understand is that what happened in your household is so small compared to the, the amount of engagement that your children have on the outside, mm. right? Okay. And, you know, they have friends from different cultures. They have friends, you know, this is a melting pot. People have yeah. different experiences. Yeah. And, you know, the bottom line is they will bring back what they learn, yeah. right? So, like what Carol was saying, that if, you know, if things start bumping heads, it's uh -huh. because in your house you're doing one thing, and then in the outside, you're doing another. Yeah. Um, so you're caught, you're caught between, the, what she was talking about, you're caught between two cultures yeah. where in your house you have to behave a certain way mm -hmm. and outside because you want to fit in with your friends, you want to... So it's a crisis, identity. Yeah, yeah you get into mm -hmm. identity crisis. It it's a crisis. So yeah. then, another thing that happens, and, 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 and I'll bring this to you, uh, that, that Shiro mentioned uh, earlier, uh, it's coming to, you know, presence as opposed to presence. Presence as of being there. Mm -hmm as opposed to rewarding you. And it's mm -hmm. like, hey, listen, you know, it's your birthday, lovely dress, iPhone, what have you. But presence is not there, especially in the formative years. Mm -hmm. the, the rules out here, in, when it comes to diaspora, our parents, us, we're coming to make this moolah. Mm -hmm. We're coming to get it. And, and, <laughs> we're, and we're still buying plots in Limuru. Right. Yeah. Okay. We're still thinking Limuru and Kinangop and Kisumu mm -hmm. and Loitoktok. Like, okay. Um, and we are hustling with the doubles. So we get the show shows to raise you guys. Yeah. All right. And then what happens along the way, um, single parenthood sets in somewhere. I don't know why the fabricate such that a lot of us will, you, you're raising a single family household. What kind of effect can you walk me into that and that whole, you know, we're still moving to Kenya, you know, we're still doing this stuff. We're still, we're never here and we're working so hard. We're neglecting what, how, what, what does that do? What just. Can you, and single parenthood, all that stuff. I mean, when you're investing in everything but raising your child because you're present everywhere else but in your child's life. You're present everywhere else but in your child's life. Parents, pay attention. You're raising, you're doing, say that again. You're present everywhere else but in your child's life. Go ahead. You're letting the world raise your child. You're letting the internet tell your child what they should be doing and who they should be. You're letting the schools tell your child who they should be and what they're supposed to be doing. And eventually you get to a point where your child is someone that you can't recognize. You don't know your child. And you question it, but the reality is you were never there. You paid the bills, you put a roof over their head, and you gave them transportation to school, and you called it raising. And it's not. You have mm. to be present in your child's life. You have to be there to mold them and to teach them the things that are important. And you have to encourage them to be, in, to be active in life. So you let your child grow up on their own, basically do their own raising along with the world, mm -hmm. And then they become someone that you didn't expect them to be. They're mm -hmm. not as Kenyan as you want them to be. And you uh -huh. have an issue now because uh -huh. they're not doing what you want them to do. And that kind of creates an identity crisis for your child because they want to be who they now know to be. And you mm -hmm. want them to be someone else. Yeah. So what happens one day you, you wake up and you wonder, what's wrong with my child? <laughs> you wake up one day, you're like, what happened? Like, and... They've been there all along, but you've never really taken the time to, to really know. be involved and to, you know, be part mm -hmm. of that. Um, what would you say in 30 seconds? What, what, okay, Shiro, what, what, do you, what do you think about that whole ideology? I mean, Carol's point as factual as day, I think, 
Yeah. A lot of responsibility lies on the parent. My only mention can be on the discipline issue. Uh-huh. I think when, you know, I was talking to a psychologist one time and she was telling me, um, whenever uh, a parent takes that belt or that whip, it's their anger. They're so angry it's with you that anger. you did something. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's your anger because you're angry at the child. And you, the only way you're going to take out on that child is by beating that child. And so the psychologist said, if the parent could at least calm down a bit, then discipline, maybe like 30 minutes after you've calmed down, the output would be different. Because I can tell you right now, there are friends of mine who are just like, beating never worked on me. And it didn't work on some people, by the way. Like, discipline doesn't need to be this whole thing of, like, beating us up, like, physically thinking it will work. It doesn't because you also have to know your child. And I think that's where the discord is. Study your child. Uh Understand who your child is. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to touch on something that is tough, a tough one. Tough, tough, tough from a parent's perspective, from a society perspective. I learned this word ideation, suicide ideation. Um, I'll let you go first. This is something that it bothers, makes this as a parent, like I said, this is something, and it's prevalent. I've been seeing it. I've been reading about it. It's happening. Um, where, where, where do we start? Well, how does it get there? So, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take it back because okay. um, a lot of, the, the coping things that I had to exercise out once I you know, got a little bit older and started uh-huh. knowing who I am uh-huh. came from my transition here. Um, I didn't mention earlier, but my mom passed away at a very young age. Okay. Oh. And that's something that I never really oh, dealt wow. with. I mean, she rest in peace. Thank you. Thank wow. you. And then, so then the transition of coming here. So within a span oh, of man. six years, my mom passed away, lived with my grandparents for another five and a half years. And then I had to come here. Okay. Wow. Um, you know, my, I, I will give props to my grandparents and my father and, and my stepmom now that, you know, they try to give me an environment that in their eyes was suitable for me to be successful, mm-hmm. right? But also I still had to deal with the turmoil of I have to adjust here, I don't like it here and so on and so on. So at some point you see no other option, right? So you're like, take me back to Kenya. No, I want to go back to Kenya. No. All right, so if, if you guys ain't going to let me go nowhere, so I might as well just and this whole charades, right? And I think um, if, you know, I've, I've had this conversation with some friends of mine and, you know, we were just shooting the breeze, just joking about childhood. And then it came to be like, you too? Like, you thought about actually doing this? And I was like, yeah, I thought about actually doing this because at that point in life, there was no way out, right? You try to talk to your parents, they're not trying to listen to you, right? You, you call your grandparents and your show shows back in Kenya and you're like, I don't like it here. I want to go back. And they're like, nope, your parents is there. Y'all work it out. Okay. And um, from, you know, I I would say this very, very frankly, I have tried suicide. Um, You know, granted that medicine cabinets are all willy nilly. You have all these type of drugs. You're 11 years old. You don't know what you're doing. So you go ahead and do a mixture and so on and so on. How old were you again? 11. Okay. Wow. So, um, So after doing that, something came over me. Right, and said that you are destined for something more. All right, there's nothing in this world that's worth doing this. You're destined for something more. And that's my philosophy ever since that point in life where I started doing things a little bit differently Mm -hmm. in terms of, you know what, Um, at this point, there's this is going to be my life. This is, I'm going to do what is going to make me happy. Mm. And um, ever since then, is, you know, there's still challenges where you have to still deal with. Um, bullies in school, right? You're uh, speaking with an accent, right? Uh, you, you're fresh off the boat. You're like, I right, listen, this is, this is what I got. Like, you know, you're, you're building with that. Um, and then um, Carol said something earlier about raising men um, mm-hmm. in this context. Uh-huh. Because I would say that a lot of the, the stresses and the... Um, the, the ideations of suicide comes from the part that you have no place, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you go to your father, you go to your household, it's like they don't want you there, right? They don't want to hear what you have to say. You have to, all right, you try everything you can do, try to fit in, yeah. right? You have friends who, you know, your boys who smoke, and you're like, let me try smoking, maybe they'll like me a little bit more. Yeah. 
you have try another to fit group, in. Yeah. You try to fit in. So there's another group that drinks. Then you're like, let me try drinking. Maybe I'll fit in a little bit more. Okay. So then literally you, you, you lose yourself in the midst of trying to fit in somewhere. Wow. And then the, the, the worst part of all is that the group that does accept you, they're up to no good. So we're going back to identity crisis over and over. It's, over for, identity crisis is a key thing. Right. Suicide ideation. What, what's, what's your take on that? Oh, jeez. Um, honestly, I just know I have people in my life that have been there. And the one thing that I came to realize helps is having a person that's there for you, that mm -hmm. understands you outside of your therapist and outside of going and getting the help that you need out there. You need somebody that trusts, that you trust and that you know and talk to them and have them have like a safe word for you. Sometimes you want to talk about what you're going through, but talking about it makes it worse. But if you have somebody that you can talk to that will distract you from the thoughts that you're having about not wanting to be here, uh -huh. that single conversation can put you two days in to where you could have been if you didn't have that conversation. It's a phone call away. And if you don't have that person, there's suicide hotlines that you can call. You can always get help. There's help out there. Mm. And wow, that's a tough one. Shiro, what, what's your take on this? Um, well, as somebody who's tried to take her life more than 10 times um, and has hey, had how, suicide how ideation. What's the first time? How old were you when you first, the first time around you had this thought or you attempted this? I was, I think I was 18. 18. I'm 28 now, so I think you're, you were an adult. Yeah. Huh? You were an adult. You were 18. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was. Um, wow. And I, I talk about it. It feels lightly talked about now because I'm kind of like just, I, am, I, I embrace it. And I'm not saying embracing it in a good way. Just like I own it because it's a part of who I am. Uh -huh. um, I've had suicide ideations passively and actively so many times. So su suicide ideation actively is when you attempt to take your life. Okay. And suicide ideation passively is when you feel like you want to die, but you have no plan which suicide ideation passively happens to me more times than I can think about. Wow. And the, the, the latest episode I think was when I came back from England earlier this year, um, before COVID hit. But, um, I think when you're suicidal, I honestly want to say the idea that people think you're being selfish is completely an out for me. Because it, even the friends who I have lost to, to suicide, when I know their stories and I know what they went through, uh -huh. I have never thought that they're selfish. Because there's a book called, oh, I think this is censored, so I can't say what the book is called. So it's, okay. <laughs> it's called to um, unrewind your brain. Uh -huh. <laughs> but Google that. I can't really remember the author. Uh, and she goes extensively into yeah. why you commit, you take your life. Yeah. And you take your life because your your body and your brain is wired like a computer. Wow. And the brain and the heart communicate every single day, every hour, every second. Wow. And if you don't take care of these things, which is why we're bringing up mental health, they implode. And it's like the way the computer heats up or it gets a virus and it shuts down. And completely that's what happens to our brains. Like our brains will get to a level where one of your subconscious is telling the other subconscious, we can't survive anymore. Mm. There's too much pain and I can't handle it. So I need you to act now before I actually, because also the body will, will get tired of grieving. It will get tired of being sad all the time. It will get tired of being stressed, of taking drugs, of drinking all the time. Yeah. So your brain and your body, it becomes completely chaotic. Wow. And that's why it's easy for someone to be addicted to drugs or alcohol because that's the only way the body is functioning, but they're so miserable. Sorry, you, you kind of like put your hands. I no, no, I'm saying, no, I'm saying, I'm saying, you know, you, you want, you're taking alcohol, you're taking drugs. You just want to, you're masking something. You feel like, you know, you're... You're like in another level. You're like you can cope with yourself, you know, for that yeah. moment in time. And for someone, for someone like me, I never rent to those things. Like I've yeah. never abused drugs. I've never, um, I've never rent to alcohol. Uh -huh. Though I socially drink. And I remember when I tried to use coke and bleach because I thought, you know, that would like eradicate me completely. And all that ended up happening was me vomiting blood for like an hour, and then I had to be taken to the hospital. Wow. But when you reach a point of suicide, it's completely like, like Caroline said, 
it's upon the people who are around you to just show you love and hold space for you because right. I can go down a whole rabbit hole talking about it, but yes. I know we don't have much time. We're going to so, do this. Yeah. You guys are going to come. I want to thank you so much. Just being so bold, just to come here and just approach this once again. And like I said, I wanted you guys here. Uh, I didn't bring any doctors here who study this stuff. I wanted us that let's hear from you guys from the get, you know, from jump and hear what you've been through. I mean, I want to thank you just for opening up. Uh, we're going to have a few sessions after this one. But something I did uh, to summarize this, I, I did some research and I have my notes here. Things not to say to someone who's mentally ill. Uh, this too shall pass. Uh, it's all part of God's plan. Uh, just try to be positive. You know, suicide is so selfish. Folks, this terminology, this is, I'm just, just me doing research for my shows, positive things that can be helpful. I'm there for you. You're not alone. We can do this. Uh, you're important to me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I love you. You know, just the basics. You know, we're going to be back, guys. This is, this is a really touchy, 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 especially for us parents. It's beyond, and it's sad we realize it's way too late, but it's never too late. You know, we can start now. We can mend these bridges. So, guys, listen. This is a good one. Please make sure to like this video. And you can tell this is touchy for me. You know, subscribe to the channel. Guys, subscribe to this. You know, that bell, that bell icon. This is, a, this is a must. This is a must talk about. We're coming back. There's so much so much to talk about. We have a podcast out, audio, every Monday, 1 p.m. It's got to be there. Uh, any questions, any comments, concern, email us. You know it, African Diaspora, you know, connects at gmail.com. I want to thank you, Gaul, Kevin. Thank you so much, Carol, and so, so much, Shiro. You know, thank you for just sharing with us. Audience, what do you guys think? You know, this was a good, this was all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Shiro. Be well. God bless. All right. Okay. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.